Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Paul's letter to the Romans. 
The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words that was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able. For the gospel hymn number 493. Oh, for a thousand times to sing. Disciples. 
Then suddenly, a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Friends, I did it again. I left my paper sermon at church, so I'm on my phone. I'm not, like, texting up here, just so you guys know. Um, that's not what's going on. I have my phone up here. Okay, so um, the gospel today, as I'm reading this gospel, you know, I read th this over and over and over for weeks leading up to preaching, uh, which means I'm always reading scripture. And the word that jumped out at me was... It's not in the gospel, but I kept thinking proximity, proximity, nearness. Jesus is eating with sinners and tax collectors. What else is new? It seems like these are the people that Jesus is always with in the gospels. It's always, oh, Jesus is with those sinners again. And it's really interesting because as they're talking, about Jesus breaking bread with these people and presumably like, you know, bumping into them as he's reaching for the olive oil or as he's reaching for the wine and being in a proximity to these people, it's very clear that their sin doesn't get on him. It's not contagious like cooties or anything. <laughs> he's not he's not like picking up their sin because he's with them. But Jesus's healing is contagious. It is contagious. As Jesus is walking around, I mean, he has a reputation for healing so much so that this leader in the synagogue who by the by would have had a beef with Jesus because Jesus threatened everything that they understood about their religion and the living out of that religion. But this guy was desperate, and so he came to Jesus to heal. And on their way, Jesus is walking along. A lady knows that he is her last chance, and so she just reaches out just, just to touch the fringe of his cloak, not his body, not even the part of his cloak that isn't the edge, that hasn't been dragging on the ground. No, she just touches the fringe of his cloak, and she is healed. She is healed. Her proximity to Jesus made it so that she had been, she'd been suffering for so long long, so long, and just being close to Jesus changed all of that. What we learn from this proximity is that good healing is transferable, and that Jesus seems to be immune to the cooties of sin, if you will, to the negative influence of the sinners. He is immune to it. But my friends, we're not Jesus. We're not Jesus, gosh darn it. We are human. We, as it turns out, are susceptible to be influenced, yes, by the good. The good is still transferable, still contagious. But for us, so is the bad. Think about it. You tell your kids and you tell your grandkids when they're growing up that they 
they need to watch out who they spend their time with, right? You want them hanging out with the right sorts of people. You don't want them being, I don't know, influenced by those bad kids. We're supposed to watch our media consumption, what we are taking in, what we're reading, what we're watching. I have to be very careful about this because I watch a lot of Survivor. And in Survivor, there's a lot of lying. And I get you, I'm like, oh yeah, lying. Like, that's fine. And then I have to remind myself that that's only okay in Survivor. <laughs> like, we don't do that out here in the world, Mary Margaret. We don't lie. You know, you just have to watch it. Because peer pressure, whether it's intentional or not, is very, very real. And that is why church is so important. Because this is the kind of peer pressure that you want. This is the good stuff. This is the, the contagious stuff, not the cooties. This is the good, good contagion that we get to share with everybody. This is our community. We gather together, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week to keep us on track. I don't know what I would do without church. I would be a hot mess all the time. I wouldn't know which way was up. Church gives me order and understanding. It keeps me on the right path, moving forward, understanding what is good, what we are seeking out. Now, it's not impossible to be good without church. There are plenty of people who are excellent human beings doing good in the world, and they do not go to church. But I know for me, it's a lot harder when I don't have y'all. It is so much harder for me to remember, for me to figure out what I'm trying to accomplish. I have to be so much more discerning. I have to ask so many more questions to make sure that I'm spending time with people who are going to make me a better person. I have to make sure that I'm watching things. I mean, Survivor's an exception. But that <laughs> I'm watching things that are going to make me a better person. When we come to church, what we get, part of why this community works so well, is because we walk in with people who are trying to accomplish something similar to us. We may be going about it in wildly different ways. We may be living totally opposite lifestyles. We may come from places that are so different we wouldn't even recognize it. But when we walk into this church, we can make a general assumption that we are good people trying to make the world a better place, or at least not trying to make it worse. <clears throat> we can know that there are people in our midst who are trying to stand up for injustice. We can know that people here are trying to care for those in society that society has said doesn't matter. We know that the people here care about creation because God made it, and because God saw that it was good. That's why church is so important and so good, and you may be thinking, well, duh. I wrote duh in here. <laughs> Of course y'all know that. I'm literally preaching to the choir right now. Y'all know that's why you're here, presumably. And if you are here because of some obligation, that's great too. That you are honoring a relationship in your life, and that is wonderful. You should feel really good about that. But church, at its finest, at its best, here at St. Michael's isn't like that for everyone. We know that church hurt is real. Church hurt is real. So many people have been harmed by this institution. So many people have been told that they 
don't matter, that they are excluded. So many other people have been told that they are included. They are in and other people are out. So many folks have been hurt. In the name of God, people have gotten up in pulpits just like this, wearing their collars, wearing their robes, wearing their stoles, and they have told people that they are either unloved or unlovable. In the name of God, church hurt is real. And we, as a community, are called to acknowledge that. We are called not to ignore it, not to say that that doesn't happen. We are called to say that is real. Those Pharisees in the gospel, their fear is real. But as it turns out, we are the ones sometimes who they should be afraid of. But that's not where we leave it, right? I'm going to bring us back up, I promise. I promise. <laughs> because what this does is it gives us an opportunity. An opportunity that we will take here in a minute to confess our sins against God and our neighbor. To own our piece of it. And to be healers. To be healers just like Jesus was, just like Jesus is in our lives and in the world. My husband, you all know Sam, um, he walks around in a suit most of the time and a collar, and uh, he owns like one pair of shorts. He is very, he's a formal guy. Uh, but he also drinks a lot of Monster Energy drinks. <laughs> which are gross. Um, he, he, he can't do caffeine. I promise this ties in. Um, caffeine has no effect on him, so he has to go to like the really serious chemicals and stuff, which I'm not thrilled about as his wife, but it is what it is. Anyway, he's in a 7-Eleven. He's in a 7-Eleven buying a Monster Energy drink. He's in his suit. He's in his clericals. He's wearing his collar. He looks like a priest. He is a priest. <laughs> and he looks the part. And he's waiting in line at this convenience store just to pay for his drink. And a gentleman walks in. Someone who we've seen at the grocery store lives in our neighborhood. And this guy just goes off. Screams at Sam is yelling at him, is hollering at him about how much evil he's doing in the world. How much church is hurting people. How much church has hurt him. And Sam says, you know, I'm really sorry about that. He pays for his drink and he comes home. And it definitely jarred him. It shook him up. Understandably, this kind of thing doesn't happen to me as much because uh, most people don't really know what to do with a lady in a collar. They think, like, that's a weird fashion choice that she's <laughs> And so I get it sometimes, but definitely not to the extent that my male colleagues do because they have, have been the ones to represent the church for ages and ages. And, um, and we talked about it. He came to the conclusion that it wasn't about him at all. Because it wasn't. This guy had been hurt. He had been hurt by the church. And he needed the church to know that. And in that moment, Sam was the church. It is jarring and upsetting when that happens, but it's also part of our job. Part of my job when I put on the collar to acknowledge that I am choosing to opt into a system that has hurt people. I am choosing to opt into a system that has previously said that I should not be allowed to do what I do. And I have to.
to square with that. I have to make my peace with that and with God. And so do all of us. All of us are called to acknowledge that we are choosing this. And this has hurt people. And that hurt can stop with us. That hurt can be transformed, is transformed in these pews right here, in this community right here. It is transformed into healing, into growth, into love. Instead of people being excluded in the name of God's love, people are included exactly as they are because God loves them. Because they are lovable. Because you are worthy by the grace of God. We get to engage in the healing work of Jesus. We get to reclaim church. We get to own it and say, no, this is the church that I'm going to be about. One of love. One of doing better. So much so that when we walk through the streets, someone could know us by just touching the fringe of our cloak. I don't know if you've ever worked with glitter. <laughs> I hear some groans appropriately because glitter gets on everything, doesn't it? It gets everywhere and it never really goes away. Glitter is going to be here at the end of days. <laughs> that glitter in the carpet, I mean, I don't see any, but I'm sure there's glitter in this carpet somewhere that's going to outlast every single one of us. <laughs> Glitter gets everywhere, and it's kind of annoying, but when you see it, doesn't it make you chuckle a little bit and remind you of that art project that you did with your kids or when you were a teacher? Doesn't it remind you of that time that your dog got into the glitter <laughs> jar and got it everywhere or your cat knocked it over? Or that time there was glue all over the place and you couldn't get it off. Or that time you flew across the world and there that glitter was in your suitcase. It gives you so much story and hope and that is God's love. God's love is glitter. And when we take fistfuls of it out of this place, we get to spread it around everywhere. And it keeps going and it stays there. Ever. My friends, when we come to church, not just to be repaired ourselves, but to repair the church, our world bursts wide open. The possibilities for our shared life together are endless. There are fistfuls of glitter all over the place for you to grab and take out of here. And then, we can experience the love of God not as boundaries that keep people in or keep people out, but boundless in its expanse. My friends, take some of this glitter with you and spread it around just like Jesus did. Amen. Amen.
the Father and the Son, and he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please join me in the prayers of the people. You may do so standing, kneeling, or sitting with me. God calls us sinners to follow Jesus. On the way, let us join all the disciples everywhere and offer prayers in the love and knowledge of God for a day that is holy, good, and peaceful. Lord, have mercy. For an angel of peace to guide us in all our paths. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For this holy gathering and for the people of God in every place. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For all nations, peoples, tribes, clans, and families. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For all that is good and bountiful for the world. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For those in danger and need, the suffering and the oppressed, travelers and prisoners, for Cindy, Mary Lynn, Horston, Paula, Vicki, Nicole and Laura, Sharon, Tom, Jay and Sabina, Janie, Kathy, Christia, Pat, Father Jim, Father Ty, Devin, Katie, Barbara, Karen, Chris, Roger, Elena, Sean, Bob, Frank, Bishop Susan, and Bishop Michael. Lord, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the dying and the dead. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For ourselves, our families, and those we love. Lord, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Remembering the Blessed Virgin Mary, Michael, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, O Lord our God. God, who gives life to the dead, receive our prayers and secret yearnings, and make us willing to follow where you lead the way. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we will be repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I don't want to break up the party here. We can hang out after. <laughs> Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vow to the Most High.
are worthy of glory and praise.
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. This is the table not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love God and for those who want to love God more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is God's will that those who want him should meet him here.
So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and spread your glitter everywhere. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.